Dr. Singapore, and I will be one of the uh, co-chairs for the session today. I'm, uh, it's my pleasure actually to represent the APSC Emerging Leaders Group, present to you all the third webinar in our CHIP Summit series, Comprehensive Approach to Calcium Modification. This event is held in collaboration with the Transcontinental CHIP Case Sharing Club, it's supported by the Singapore Cardiac Society, accredited by EBEC, and we'd like to give uh, thanks to Boston for supporting this series uh, with educational grants. Today, um, it's my pleasure to have uh, with me co-chair, Dr. Jonathan Sung from Hong Kong. And we have an esteemed panel of speakers, Dr. Himanshu Gupta from India, as well as Dr. Sidney Lowe from Australia, who will deliver two keynote lectures on imaging to guide uh, calcium modification, as well as tips and tricks and complications of rotablations. This will be followed by two very interesting cases presented by Dr. Tanbe Ahmad from Bangladesh, as well as Dr. Su from Australia. We have with us a very experienced lineup of panelists, Dr. Jack Tan from Singapore, Dr. Vincent Luke from Hong Kong, Dr. Tanawat Suiset from Thailand, Dr. Dayan Munawa from Indonesia, and Dr. Vishnu Aditya also from Indonesia. This is a quick uh, shout out to some of our upcoming uh, webinars. The APSC on the 15th of April is organizing the use of intravascular imaging and bifurcations. A quick shout out to another event by the Emerging Leaders Community, um, the approach and the management of acute heart failure. This will be the first in a series of teaching moments in heart failure. Some disclaimer and housekeeping, the contents of this webinar is copyrighted by the APSC and the views and opinions expressed are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. For those of you all who want to watch this after the events ended, you know, this video will be available on the Facebook and YouTube pages. Importantly, if you all have any questions that you would like to ask, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom and post your questions there and we will try to answer them during the discussion session. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. It's a very close friend of mine, uh, Dr. Himanshu Gupta. He works in the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in India. He's a very experienced operator who has done hundreds of uh, rotation cases. You know, we look forward to learning from him today. He's going to talk to us about using intravascular imaging to guide the choice of uh, calcium modification. Uh, over to you, Gupta. Uh, thank you, John. And it's always a pleasure uh, uh, to come to, uh, to come to a webinar organized by uh, one of my close friends and teachers. So uh, I'll just go to the screen share. Uh, can you see my screen, John? Not yet. Uh, can you see yep. it now? You can see your screen now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'll I'll just I'll not uh, take um, too much time. I'll uh, get to the job uh, quickly. So it's a great pleasure to be at a webinar organized by APSC. As you know, I was trained at National Heart Center with John, so we are very close friends. So uh, I was asked to talk about uh, use of imaging in calcified lesions. Uh, today I've uh, I've limited my talk to one of the imaging modalities that is IVUS, so that we have a continuity in what we talk about. So I don't think there is any doubt that imaging improves outcomes. More complex the PCI, more difficult are uh, good outcomes, and I think imaging really helps. Also, complexity and calcium are best buddies. So I mean, the most complex things are the things that are most calcified, whether it is the valve or it is coronaries. I think calcium and complexity go hand in hand. There are some concerns that you know it is difficult to analyze calcium on IVERS versus an OCT. We cannot take thickness of uh, calcium on IVERS, but I don't think uh, all of these concerns matter a lot because I think IVERS is equally, if not more useful uh, to treat calcified lesions. I think calcium is very easy to see on IVERS. It is, it is a bright structure, whereas sometimes we may struggle to see calcium on OCT, although we can measure thickness of calcium, but I always believe that probably identification of calcium is much more easy on an IVERS as compared to an OCT. 
And do we really need to uh, uh, measure the thickness of calcium to predict stent under expansion? So this was the last uh, IVAS score, which is very famous, published by uh, the Columbia Group in 2021. So if you look at this score, what you know is that if, if there is a calcium arc of more than 270 degrees for more than 5 millimeters of length, you get a point. If there is a ring calcium, that is 360 degree of calcium, you get a point. If there is a nodule of calcium, you get a point. And if the vessel diameter is less than 3.5, you get a point. So this is what we all understand. So if the calcium score is more than 2, we always uh, need atherectomy to get good stent under expansion, a good stent expansion. But what is often missed is that this always starts with a rider, whether there is angiographic calcium or not. So we cannot take imaging and interpret the imaging in isolation. If there is angiographic calcium, then you should measure the score. If there is no angiographic calcium, as has been shown in multiple studies, that generally the calcium burden is less. And even if the calcium is there on imaging, it is generally thin and it is easily modified by normal balloons. So if there is calcium on angiogram, then the calcium score comes into the place. And that is the point that is sometimes not uh, put across as clearly. So I'll just quickly go to two cases, which are very complementary cases and which will uh, take us to our algorithm of using imaging. The first is the 82-year-old male with usual risk factors of CAD, presenting with class 3 angina with an ejection fraction of 40% about two years back. So this was his angiogram. He had a distal left main uh, calcified disease, uh, had very heavily calcified uh, coronary arteries. As you can see in the epicranial view, we can see the whole length of the LED even without injecting any contrast. And on the right uh, injection, we see the right PDA is occluded, which was known occluded for many years. So he basically had a left main bifurcation disease presenting with a non-STEMI. So he was 82 year old. Of course, he's not fit for uh, bypass surgery at that age was refused by the surgeons. And we need to do a good job to save this gentleman. As we know that octogenarians generally uh, do not to tolerate less than a perfect result. So you start with uh, uh, a seven thread guiding catheter. IABP was uh, in uh, position because of his poor EF and uh, complex coronary artery disease. I think we started with a rotablator as according to what we normally do, because I don't think IVAS catheter will cross this mid LED lesion. And there is no point putting in an imaging catheter to know what you have to do. You know you need to do rotablator for this kind of case to have any chance of good device delivery later on in the procedure. So after you've done the first rotablation, that is a 1.5, uh, a moderate size per. After that, you protect the large diagonal. And at that point, you put in the imaging catheter to see what you need to do later. So these are the three points of interest, the distal LED, number two, the mid LED, and number three, the distal left mid. So what you see, it's very circumferential calcium throughout the length of the LED from the distal to the proximal LED. It's almost a ring calcium with some rotablator effects you see. But on the distal left main, we see a calcified nodule from 11 to 1 o'clock, which has a favorable wire bias. So what you do, you do imaging, you, decide, you select the balloon, a conservative balloon, and you go high pressures. So that is what we did. We took a 2.5, which is a little conservative balloon, but we went up to 28 atmospheres in the proximal LED. And you know this balloon is not opening. So what should we do further? There is a failure of NC balloon. We can probably use a large burr, but we also have to understand that this patient has a occluded right coronary artery, has an ejection fraction of 40%, is on IABP. You've already used a 1.5 burr. So if you need a large burr, a 1.75 or 2, with the length of ablation that you require, there is very high chances that you may have a slow flow, which will be very poorly tolerated in this scenario. You can try an OPN or a cutting balloon at high pressures, but it's very diffuse lesion. It's not just one focal lesion where you try these technologies. You also know from imaging that it's a circumferential calcium, a type of calcium where the IBL is very safe and is very effective. So we go for an IBL, a three millimeter IBL balloon for the distal LED, the same three millimeter for the mid LED, which opens after a few pulses. And then we take a 3.5 millimeter IBL balloon for the proximal LED and the distal left main. We, the, the balloon opens nicely in the proximal LED, the distal left main. And the last two pulses of the three millimeter balloon, we try to use it in the circumflex, as you can see at the ostium of the circumflex after some pre dilatation with the non compliant balloon. So here is the most interesting part of the, of the, of the case. 
So you see the three millimeter uh, IVL balloon rupturing in the left frenum. So as, as it ruptures, you see there is an intramural hematoma in the left uh, in the left main artery. But thankfully, there are a few stents in the LED already, and there is wire down both vessels, so you can quickly treat it. But why did it happen? Look at the morphology of the calcium in the distal left main. So here you see from 11 to 1 o'clock, you have nodular calcium, which is very sharp and spiky. And on the part of the osteal circumplex, we did not rotablate. a blade. So these were one of the very first cases we used an IVL, and we did not know in which morphology it will work better than, than a rotablator. So I think uh, knowing this, this ruptured probably because of the nodularity of the calcium at that location, but somehow it modified the calcium and we were able to do a, uh, a mini crush uh, for uh, the left main and LED. So the left main to LED was stented, circumflex was stented, a pot was done, followed by a kissing balloon inflation. And we got acceptable result at the left main bifurcation and in the LED. So if you look at the final IVUS, uh, I'll just uh, go quickly in the IVUS. You see very well expanded circular stent in the proximal LED up to the left main. I'll not go into the circumflex or the bifurcation uh, part of it, but you can see that the stent is very circular and very well expanded as you would expect in circular calcium after use a rotablator in combination with the IVL. So we got very good stent areas, about nine millimeter square in the mid uh, LED and about 16 millimeter scales in the left main. So this, uh, this patient did really well with a combination of what we call is a rotatripsy. But what we learned from this case is what we applied in the next. So this is the second and the last case of the presentation. So a 72 year old male treated just a month back, presenting with a paroxysmal AF and hypertension to an outside hospital with the positive biomarkers, had a normal EF. And this was the angiogram that was done uh, by a friend of mine about two months back at his hospital. So he has some haziness uh, in the distal left main, uh, which they were not sure at that time. So what this haziness is, uh, I'm not sure if you can appreciate uh, that uh, filling defect in the distal left main. The right coronary artery was normal. He had a atrial fibrillation and presenting with acute non stemi so they thought that probably it's thrombus. So they put him up, uh, put him in on uh, newer anticoagulants, that is NOAX, uh, along with DAPT for a month and then called him back uh, for an angiogram a month later. So this was his angiogram a month later on the right panel with a guiding catheter. You can see there is a, there is a filling defect in the distal left wing, which, which, which by now we know that it's a calcified nodule and nothing else, or a chunk of calcium and not thrombus because it is essentially unchanged since the month uh, after the acute presentation. So then he was referred to us for, for a PCI. So I think this is the type of uh, case which which uh, which looks very simple but can be very nasty because unless you modify this calcium properly, you will have a lot of problem treating this. So we did an imaging uh, from both both limbs. So this is the first run of the IVUS from left main to circumflex. Here you see nodular calcium coming from five to seven o'clock. And when the LED comes, you see the, there is no plaque opposite the carina. So it's very unusual location for atherosclerosis as we know. Atherosclerosis happens away from the carina, but here the whole of the calcium burden is at the carina. So this is the circumflex run pre, and there you see a nodular calcium with good bias uh, at about seven o'clock. And this is the IVUS run from the LED. So IVUS run from the LED is, uh, is more important here. You see very thick uh, nodular calcium, almost hugging the IVUS catheter at the ostium of the LED with the very narrow lumen, which was uh, less than two millimeter scare at the ostium of the LED. So uh, there are many devices to treat calcium, but I think in this, uh, from whatever we have, the experience that we have is that whenever you have nodular calcium with this tight lumen, I think rotablator is the best device. We should not even think about cutting balloons and see balloons and IVL. We should ablate it as much as possible. So we started with a 1.75 millimeter buff uh, from left main to LED. And after doing a 1.75 millimeter burr, uh, we, we thought we, of course, need additional device. 1.75 will be too less uh, for LED, which is almost four millimeters. So we decided we'll use a two millimeter burr. So we ablated the left main to LED with a two millimeter burr at 180,000 RPM. Took an angiogram after that, uh, and everything looked all right. We had already done imaging to the circumflex. We know there is good wire bias. Uh, 
uh, for the nodule, even in the circumflex, as we just saw. So we took the one for two millimeter burr into the circumflex from the left main and ablated in both directions. And after ablation uh, with two millimeter burr, you already see uh, the uh, filling defect almost gone. So after that, you did imaging from both arms. And this is the pre and the post imaging for the LED, which is very interesting. So you see uh, on the right panel, there is post uh, two millimeter burr. You see significant lumen gain, thinning of calcium at the ostium of the LED, and some reverberations, uh, which show that the calcium has been uh, shaven off. So this is the ostial LED pre. On the left panel and on the right panel, you can say without balloon dilatation, just with the burr, you've gained almost two millimeter. That is the lumen diameter uh, you gained because of the burr. You see very good reverberations from two to six o'clock. You even see the vessel beyond the intimal calcium. That also means that the calcium has thinned out so that the ultrasound beam is able to penetrate the calcium. So this is the type of calcium which is now ready to crack with your next device, which is either a balloon or a cutting balloon. And this is the IVUS uh, after the two millimeter burr from the circumflex. Here again, you see, you don't make too much of difference in the circumflex because the calcium burden was not very high. But after the ablation, the nodularity of the calcium is much, much less. You don't have any spicule ha hanging out into the circumflex. And on the right panel, you can see the LED wire coming in from five o'clock. And we, so that is the carina. So the calcium is located whole at the carina. And opposite to the carina, there is no plaque. So that will also help you in going further in the procedure. So after that, we decide to use a cutting balloon or scoring balloon. In this case, a 3.5 millimeter scoring balloon in LED and circumflex. And after scoring balloon, we repeated the IVUS uh, at the tightest most, most lesion that was the hostile LED. And we see few cracks uh, at five o'clock, at seven o'clock and at nine o'clock, we see three cracks after the cutting balloon. So you expect that uh, you know this uh, stent will expand nicely at this location. So now is the issue of using one versus two stent. So this is this is the case where it is not very straightforward because the circumflex lesion is not very tight. But we also know that you know the the hole of the calcium is at the carina. There is no plaque opposite the carina, and we can expect that if we only stand from left main to LED, there can be a lot of carina shift towards the circumflex, and it will be very difficult to tackle it later. So despite uh, you know the ostium circumflex not looking very tight, but because of the anatomy, particular anatomy, we decided that we'll go up front to stand. So we decided to do a mini crush, but we did not want to cover the wall opposite the carina because there was no plaque. So we could protrude very minimally. So do almost like a T uh, in this uh, anatomy. So we stented with a 3.523 in the in the circumflex. Uh, did uh, osteal post dilatation of the circumflex stent before uh, crushing with a four millimeter balloon, crushed it, and then stented left mid to LED with another 3.5 34 millimeter stent. Did a pot with a 4.5 millimeter balloon, and then did final kissing with 3.5 and 4 millimeter balloons in LED and circumflex respectively, and then did IVUS. So this is the post LED IVUS from uh, LED to left main. We see a short neocarina because we did almost like a T. We see the circumflex wire coming in and we have coverage of the uh, left main ostium. The ostial LED had an area of about 11.0, which is uh, quite acceptable for a four millimeter vessel. And this is the ostial circumflex post stenting. Here again, we see a short metallic neocarina with an area of about 11.5 in the circumflex as well. So this was the pre picture on the left side. And this is the final picture on the right side. Uh, the patient did well uh, with well expanded stents. So my last two slides. So calcified lesions, my approach is very simple. If there is moderate to severe angiographic calcium or diffuse calcified lesion, don't start with imaging, start with the rotablator. So you choose a small rotablator, 0.5 bar to artery ratio, mostly a 1.5 bar. And once you've done the initial bar of 1.5, generally do IVUS or OCT, whichever you prefer. And on IVUS, if you have nodular calcium with good bias, upsize the bulk to at least 1.75 or 2 millimeter if the patient's clinical condition allows you to do so. If there is no nodular calcium on your imaging, then decide the balloon size according to the imaging catheter and then try balloon, whether it is a cutting balloon or a non-compliant balloon. If the balloon works, cracks, it's fine, you are ready to stent. If the balloon does not work, review your imaging again. If there is circumferential calcium, you can afford an IVL balloon or the IVL balloon is available. That is the best device. Use IVL. 
after your initial rotor blitter and failure of a non-compliant balloon. If you don't have an IVL or if there is no circumferential calcium, then you must thin out the calcium as much as possible. So upsize the bar again and then try a balloon again to crack the calcium. But remember, do not stent before you crack. So crack before you stent is very important. So in summary, imaging is essential to treat calcified lesions with safety and efficiency. Rotablator is the most versatile and the best device for calcium period. There is no, no nothing which works like rotablator. Imaging at each step is very essential to decide the next strategy. So not just first part of the procedure or the last part of the procedure, at each step it is very important. And rotablator, along with IVL and OPM, they all are complementary technologies and they are not competitive devices. They're all very complementary. But we also need to know with experience that there are situations when we will not get a perfect result, like a very eccentric calcium without good wire bias in a small vessel. We will never get an MSA, which is 90% of the distal reference. So we need to know when we cannot get a perfect result, but only an appropriate or a safe result for the patient. So imaging helps us in doing that as well. So I think in the end, we all want good sleep. So if you want good sleep, you must do imaging. Otherwise, you can't sleep after treating these patients. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Captain. That's a very comprehensive and amazing summary of uh, the use of imaging for uh, calcified disease. Uh, there's one thing I really agree is uh, you need to crack before you stand. After you stand, uh, uh, your options are very limited. There isn't much you could do. Um, so any thoughts or comments from the panel? Um, Vincent, what's your thought? Do you, do you use IVIS or um, are you a fan of OCT and uh, calcified disease? Yeah, Vincent. Hi. <laughs> Uh, yeah, usually, you know, I think OCT for sure, it will tell them more, you know, because it's see through with the, the higher penetration. So to me, if I can anticipate you know, that a lot of uh, calcium, you know, in angiogram, I tend to use OCT in most, most of the cases. Because I think with OCT, at, at least I can appreciate the thickness. And of course, sometimes when you use rotablator or, you know, sometimes we we use uh, IVL, then I can see the crack a little bit more detail. You know, sometimes when you do IVL and you do IVs again, probably you just thought you had make the cracks, but there's micro fract um, fracture, then probably you can't really appreciate in IVs. So if that's, if I have a choice, then I would tend to use OCT in those cases. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I know why. Um, Imaging can tell you a lot about the cracks, but um, sometimes I'm wondering, like, is it more important to show uh, the expandability with like um, a high pressure balloon than than to really show the cracks on imaging? Like, like even if you see the cracks, it doesn't really mean your stand would expand. But uh, personally, like, I like to use like a high pressure balloon to make sure like it expands and uh, then the stand fully work. But I, I don't know, like, how do uh, how much crack or um, like, how does it, uh, how do you uh, assess those cracks on your imaging? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, your, your approach is, is totally practical. You know, when the balloon kind of opens, then you're for sure that the, the stem will open. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if the uh, balloon, sometimes if it causes really back, dis back dissection, and it will limit us on our next step. Should we you know, upsize the burr? Should we have a high pressure balloon? And of course, when there's a massive crack, we know that there's always a chance of dissection. So to me, you know, I also learned from the colleagues from this uh, US, like if you go for a diamond bag cases, probably you don't need a, a very high pressure balloon or you, your high pressure balloon can only go up to like 10 to 12 atmosphere and that would be good enough. And that's kind of changed my thoughts because to me, uh, for some time, I like to see those bad dissection because I, I, you know, for that, I know that my stem would go in and then I know that I was done it anyway. So for at that time, I would tend to see bad dissection, but you know, with time, I changed my belief a little bit, um, but I would be happy to see you know, other panelists or experts 
for their approach or their opinion. Vishnu, what's your approach here? Yeah, great talk by Gupta. Thanks a lot. So actually, there there's lots of good issues that can be talked here. So the first one, uh, Gupta presented two cases, and both are quite old patients with ACS, right? With both are non stem eyes, and in both uh, there were massive calcification, and you did uh, you did astrectomy. So I just want to ask Gupta, uh, in your opinion. Are you not afraid to do directly atherectomy in patient with non stemi I mean, are you concerned of there's a, a vulnerable plaque there that it might might crack or might might burst when you do a rota first or you do imaging first? Because in your last slide, you said that in your algorithm, then you tend to do rota first. How 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 do you think of that that approach in ACS patient? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Vishnu. Yeah, I think both of them were non STEMI, not ST elevation MI. So, uh, honestly, we're not scared to use a rotablator in a non STEMI unless the troponins are very high or we see a of, lot of thrombus on the angiogram. But uh, my algorithm, what I try to do rota first is because generally, if you see moderate to severe calcium on an angiogram, especially if it is a diffuse lesion, generally, rotablator is always beneficial, if not in cracking. It's in future delivery of devices that you may require. If you don't do a rotablator, you may crack with a balloon, but then you sometimes your stent delivery is troublesome. Sometimes your bifurcation treatment is troublesome. Once you smoothen the vessel out with a rotablator, your procedure becomes very predictable later on. So you do the hardest part of the procedure first. So you are always positive ahead of the curve. You don't do rotablator, half of the time you are thinking, oh God, I should have done rota. I would not have struggled. You do the rota first, so you've done the hardest part, which you think is the hardest part. Arrest, everything is easy. Even if you use an IVL, the IVL doesn't go in easily in most of these cases. But you've done a rota first. You don't dilate a balloon. You know your IVL will go in easily wherever you want it to. If you don't do a rota up front, you struggle for device delivery so much. So I think you can crack it without rota with so many things that we have now. But there is nothing like rota. You do rota first. After that, your device delivery is easy, your imaging catheter goes down very easily, and you can build upon your case very easily. Uh, so I, I believe to do uh, this way, but I am open to, uh, I'm there are my teachers are there on the panel, Dr. Jack is there, Dr. Sydney is there, we would like, like to have their comments as well, but this is the way I feel. I think if you have a good rota technique, you don't have slow flow or no flow in non stem You don't have- If, if, you, if you find, uh, it's not easy, but if you find, uh, if you suspect a vulnerable plot between the calcium, will you still do a rota, Gupta? Uh, see, a vulnerable plot, you will only know if you know, you've know you done an OCT or something like that. But yeah, uh, if, yeah. even yeah. if the vulnerable plot is there, Vishnu, at the end of the day, we have to expand our stents even to treat that vulnerable plot. So if you don't do plot modification properly, we will struggle either in the beginning or later on. I mean, if you have slow flow either in the beginning or you'll have an underexpanded strength or device delivery failure later on in the procedure. So I think doing the most uh, difficult or challenging part of the procedure in the beginning is always good. You stay ahead of the curve. Then you can manage everything, whatever you do. Thanks, Yuta. Hey, Jack, what's your thought? Yeah, thanks, uh, Guta. <clears throat> Wonderful lecture. I like your two cases because it really is a counterpoint. Maybe me and Sydney are a bit more elderly, so express the old time thoughts here. Uh, firstly, there are some comments about you dissect the artery to hell, you're going to put it in a stand anyway, it's fine. And the audience also asked about if you see a lot of dissection, that means it's okay. I just like to caution about that. Because if you really have a lot of calcium and you balloon, the dissection is actually most of the time in the normal, non calcified segment. So you have to be very careful about seeing a lot of dissection, thinking it's actually all right. But coming from the old stance, I think not all cases, you need to complement the imaging with what you see on angiogram. If it's, the imaging helps you because it gives me the confidence to use appropriately sized balloon, whether NC or cutting, and it really opens up well on two octagonal planes. Yeah. I, I maybe don't need the imaging to tell me that, that that's probably adequate. Exactly. Because sometimes the uh, IVERS, I mean, sometimes it's tough to see real good cracks, but I rely on angiogram more, but the safety 
comes with the imaging for the landing, the sizing, so that you don't miss the spot and diffuse disease. One thing about uh, Gupta's algorithm, I know what he's trying to say is that the two cases show really different scenarios where I think upfront rotoblader helps because if you have the first case, I agree, is upfront rotoblader without imaging, you can tell. And then the second one is probably more focal nodular calcium management, which we can debate upon. When you like to go with upfront rotor first, I think it depends on experience and comfort. So I, I wouldn't advise that as a routine, you must upfront. Um, and of course, sometimes the advice is that if you have done a rotor regret, maybe you discuss that later, you also need to know when to stop and then perhaps bring back for a finish up rotor and not in the same time for certain cases. Uh, got more to discuss. I wouldn't hold back the panel. Uh, back to you, uh, John. Thanks. Panel, you have a comment here? Yes. Uh, uh, I have a question about the nodular, nodular calcium. It's very really difficult to deal with nodular calcium. In my experience, I just used uh, with rotabator and uh, combination with the cutting balloon or high pressure balloon. But uh, initial result is uh, okay, but with follow up, it is uh, not good. It has the high rate of instantaneous stenosis uh, after neuroli calcium management. So I want to uh, ask uh, Dr. Gupta and our panelists uh, what is the best device uh, or have anyone have experience about the orbital arthrectomy to manage with neuroli calcium? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think for the uh, nodular calcium rotablator and Probably orbital, we don't have much experience with orbital. We have uh, panelists who use it, uh, so we don't have it in India yet. We have it just a month back. So I think the largest possible bur, depending upon the clinical condition of the patient, is probably the best device for nodular calcium. Like in the first case, he was elderly with diffuse disease uh, with low EF. We ended up using only a 1.5 millimeter balloon, and we have a rupture of an IVL with the nodular calcium. Whereas in the second case, it was a normal ejection fraction, focal lesion. So we were very comfortable using a two millimeter burr because we know we don't have slow flow, no flow situation in this scenario. So I think if there is nodular calcium and the clinical overall clinical picture of the patient allows you to safely use the largest possible burr that you have, I think probably that is the safest device for nodular calcium if the bias is good. Or an orbital. The orbital goes up to about 1.75 millimeter burr. But I think from nodular calcium, what we learned from our Japanese colleagues are that they always use two, 2.15, 2.25 millimeter burrs to take away as much as the nodule before this stent. So I think probably for nodular calcium, the largest possible atherectomy device, which can be safely used, is the best. All right, thanks very much, Gupta. And um, so we'll move on to our next talk, um, our keynote lecture today by Dr. Sidney Lowe. Um, I think uh, Dr. Sidney Lowe does not require much introduction. You probably know him very well. He is the cath lab director at Liverpool Hospital, New South Wales, Australia. And um, he's a renowned inter interventional cardiologist, not just in the AP region, but also around the world. Uh, he's recognized in internationally as a CTO and complex BCI expert. So without further ado, uh, um, We'll let um, uh, Sydney uh, speak to us about the tips and tricks of road ablation and more importantly, how to deal with the complications that arise from this uh, intervention. So uh, it's uh, great to speak to everyone and good to see. I enjoyed the last talk because uh, I hope you can hear me. The uh, My audio is okay. The uh, Himanshu's talk was uh, quite seminal and that's why the talk's first because one of the major tips is uh, intravascular imaging. Here are my conflicts of interest. So Jack already told you, we used to regret this after we put a stent in and say, maybe we should have uh, a rotational arthritis this before you put a stent in. So now we are very conscious of calcium if we see a lot of angiographic calcium. So core lab definitions of calcium on either wall uh, will increase your probability of modifying this plaque. Now, uh, I learned many years ago from a Japanese, if they, they're they very keen on imaging, and if you couldn't put the Arvis catheter down, that was the indication for rotational atherectomy to pass your gear. And then you assess what, what you've done with your atherectomy, uh, the initial run of rotor. So, uh, but if you could cross, then the imaging catheter tells you whether or not you need to address this more than you need to. 
And after you've done any sort of modification with plaque, NC balloon, or rotational arthrectomy, then you can assess the effectiveness of that prior to scenting. Renew interest. So it's, if you look at this curve in the early part, um, that was the initial stent phase in 1993, 94, when uh, bimbal stents were really uh, approved and stent mania occurred. But the second half is mostly driven by the DES era. But we know that actually now it's very mature. We're taking on complicated lesions, very complicated lesions. The equipment has improved, the wires, microcatheters, and even the stent performance. And we've got now formalized fellowships. And the training, I think, has improved. Our understanding and treatment with statins and antiplatelets have definitely become better. But the, our aging population and patient expectations have increased. Uh, and I think that we've actually improved our PCR outcomes as driving a lot of demand for patients who don't want to have surgery. Well, what are the indications? Undilatable lesion, uncrossable lesion. But I would argue that when it was first invented, we want to cut out as much plaque like directional arthrectomy and it had a higher event rate and complication rate. But now we really just want to cut it through so we can get a good stent in. The original concept of differential cutting is that it cuts the more calcified inelastic tissue more than the soft or elastic tissue. And people, uh, the inventor, David Orth, used to put his thumb um, actually on the on the egg shell that's raw and put uh, with a burr in between and spin it under the water. But in fact, he used to do this on his tongue with a bit of fluid on it. And uh, But every now and then, it might nick his tongue, which means that you can still cut elastic tissue if you push hard enough. Hence, I'm going to talk a bit about why bias. One of the tricks is you need to understand why bias. It can help you and it can hurt you. The illustration on the left, you can, you've seen that the initial run across the left main bifurcation, let's say, really can hurt that carina. And the differential cutting, differential cutting helps you. Notice on the, on the right-hand side, it tends to ablate without cutting through the artery. But if you push hard enough, you can. You can actually change. Look at the yellow is where the guiding catheter also drives some wire bias as the bifurcation anatomy. And the, the yellow is what you would look like with a guiding catheter that's yellow. But with the green, you also change the wire bias. And changing wires across the bifurcations will change the way your burr is directed. And this leads to something very similar to orbital arthrectomy. Vessel, vessel tortuosity is a big problem. And it's a relative contraindication to rotational arthrectomy. You can cut where you don't want to cut. In a tortuous vessel, we literally do a sate, a shush kebab. We straighten out a tortuous artery, and there's increased wire bias and tension. That can hurt you very badly. And, and traditionally, we told operators to downsize the burr because you minimize the risk, but there's still a risk. So currently, the standard way of looking at this is doing an angiogram during your platform before your burr runs to see where your wire is and understand on the angiogram where your biases are before you take your burr through it. I only use rotate, uh, rotor floppy wires, but there is many schools of thought uh, because rotor extra support wires will increase your wire bias, will improve cutting towards the wire bias, but perhaps as a high risk of perforation if you're very aggressive with the burr sizing. Imaging, therefore, is key to me. If you need to, if you need, sometimes you need to cross with a rotational arthrectomy 1.5 burr before you can actually get imaging catheter across. But of course, as you know, on the imaging catheter, it is really cutting to where the, where the side is, where the bias is shown to you by the imaging catheter. And we generally should start with conservative sizing. You can see on this illustration on the left-hand side, there's a lot of tension around this curve. But if you have less wire tension, it's a more smoother run. And traditionally, we actually described, I was taught a stepwise burr approach. But as you know, that was very expensive at the time. And they, and they actually try to cut costs with a rotor link system. They separate the burr at the advancer. So you can use a number of burrs, to try to reduce cost. And therefore, for cost economy, people wanted to do one burr cases. Hence, currently, we're in a situation that worldwide, the 1.5 millimeter burr is the preferred size uh, universally. But I'm coming back to the idea that you, on some special cases, then you may need a two burr approach. Contemporary rotational arthrectomy use, therefore, is really to allow you to get PCI equipment down and to facilitate um, even the proximal cap approach to it if you have difficulty passing equipment. The plaque modification may help to optimize stent expansion. So these combinations we're seeing now very often, rotor shock, NC ballooning, and stent. Now, I didn't put imaging runs in between, 
but he should be imaging as well. Rota, NC Pova, and a stent. Rota, NC Pova, plus or minus shock wave, drug eluting balloon or stent. And that may be more likely in a calcified instant restenosis. And of course, complicated cases and even uh, retrograde uh, externalization wires, very difficult to cross for stents. You may want to rotate those. These are the wires traditionally, the rotor floppy and the rotor extra support. And mind you, I only use rotor floppy. And now we have rotor wire drive, which is now with Asahi wiring technology, you may be able to wire. So this is very good because if you can't get a rotor wire across the lesion, you can't burr it. We've now changed the concept of it. We really just need to make a crack. So we, this is particularly pertinent to shockwave data. We see average three cracks in the disrupt three trials. You make a crack, you can dilate the calcium part, at least stretch it. And I perfectly understand that if you get a very aggressive size OPN balloon or even an NC balloon, you will rupture the vessel. So it doesn't matter if you've rotated wrote it, it and only have a crack or three, but if you really try hard enough, the chance of rupturing vessel much higher. I'll show you a case, not of that rupture, but basically this is an eccentric, very eccentric circumflex lesion you can see on the left and right hand panels. And this is a trying to be a one burr case, 1.75 millimeter burr. And the fellow was very keen, pushed pretty hard. I did not capture this stuck burr, but it was stuck and pulled back with a guide wing forward. And this is the polishing run, still a little bit tricky. Here's the ibis. I'll run it a bit faster. You can see calcified nodge calcium there about 12 o'clock, at least a 3 vessel, sometimes getting a bit larger, more proximally. And you will see probably coming around here, this is the, the, the bias of the catheter on the about nine o'clock. And you can see great disruption, Rotor signature, almost two millimeters, and EEL and a, a tissue hematoma. So either the, the cut has disrupted the avant tissue there, as well as the uh, pulling that burr back. So when your buck, uh, burrs are stuck and you pull hard and you get the burr out, there's a high risk of perforation. Patient had a complicated PCI procedure and then a very good result in a circumflex. A second case, 77 year old man, a little bit of renal dysfunction, bad angina. This is his anatomy. Distal left main, circumflex, tortuous LAD. Distal left main, looks worse on the LAO view, very tortuous proximal LAD. This is the osteo and diffusely calcified right coronary artery. So there's no, um, no doubt that we would think surgery and patient had surgery. Six months later, he had angina again, quite badly actually. The only graft that's open is the vein graft to the OM branch. We did rotor and stent the right coronary artery, very, very approachable, but his angina continued to be bad. So he presented for an LED approach and we felt that we had to modify at least the distal left main. And so this is the wire, very tortuous. This is a relative contraindications of rotational arthrectomy. We persisted though, this is a 1.25 millimeter burr. You may say that's not very big and that's true. This is some approach at cutting. And there is an increased risk of um, rotoring off the distal tip because uh, usually when it, it, it can jump forwards on the run. But we were lucky, we exchange. This is an NSE scoring balloon, leopard crawled, gut extension, left main was stented, stents were passed through torch velocity. And we found a reason why the LAD failed because you can see the lemur's filling at the site of a stenosis that's calcified. That was stented. And you can see clearly the lima going to the left-hand side to about 11 o'clock. And he did very well with stenting at his age. And that's the result in the LAO. Now, how to avoid complications? Well, prevention is always better than cure. So therefore, learning meticulous technique, controlling the drilling passes, and understanding just simple troubleshooting about the system, and even the flush and the clip being on are very important things. For example, this is the Dana guy. There's always been controversial. You can be one-handed, actually one man. I've been doing a lot of Donaglide one-handed now with the clip into the Vansa. There is a small possibility of cutting in the guiding catheter if you're aggressive with this burring size, but it is there's no tension in the system. If you're having a two-man job, not using Donaglide, you have to be careful and release the potential energy stored and release the tension. Otherwise, it can jump, and therefore you can coquesse into the lesion what are the complications, right? This is a NIH stat pearls, and you can see they quote a 1% death 
uh, rate from meta-analysis of all the trials and registries, about 1.2% risk of myocardial infarction, and similarly up to 2.5% risk of emergency cabbage, and about 1.5% to 7 8% of snow reflow, current spasm, 1.5%, dissection, 10%, current perforation, 1.5%, burr transection is rare, entrapment of burr, 0.4% only. Now, this is a Japanese PCR registry encompassing about 3.2% of their cases, 13,000 cases in Japan. And you know, Japan's very finicky. Only some hospitals are allowed to do rotational anthectomy. Their combined MACE rate of in-hospital death, tamponade, emergency surgery was 1.3%. Predictors, notably, is age, CKD, previous infarct, and free cell disease. But institutionally, if you are doing higher volumes, you have a half the risk pretty much known about volume of work in procedural medicine. This is prevention for no reflow. So perhaps noting your ablation sizes, avoiding excessive decelerations, keeping good blood pressure, pre-medication. But you would argue that maybe Impella may be good in this if you can afford it in some patients who are high risk. And immediate treatment is very important for bailout. If you're having issues, then administration of intracoronary vasodilators as an eye pride, very useful. I'll show you some Australian data. This is from Queensland over a nine year period, three centers without surgery. They had a quite a high rate of burr entrapment in current dissections. You can see their overall rate is quite high, more than 2%. And if your burr got stuck, you can see that uh, they were looking at seven burrs got stuck in during this nine year period. You can see that mostly manual retracted and one surgical referral. There's a published uh, paper on the algorithm for stuck rota rotational arthritis burr, where you, they use a wire to recross and try to balloon it off, and then cutting the sheath and trying to wire again. But actually, I think this has been modified in recent times, where we are now really just cutting it quickly, gut extension, and using counter-traction to pull the burr out. So fresh implanted scent should be avoided, very high rate of burr uh, entrapment, calcific calcium, or high burr artery ratio. Don't forget the surgeons, they are also in published cases, are very much uh, in the fray of trying to help you out. I would not recommend that you spin the burr anymore because that may lead to fracture of the burr completely off the shaft. And so this, is, this algorithm is largely related to uh, what we just talked about. So we need to cut the shaft at that tip there. And this is a case of an 88 year old lady having a right coronary rotation arthrectomy. Notice it's quite a reasonable sized burr and it's stuck very quickly in this case. And with a tug and removal, there's a wire on the left hand side trying to be wide, uh, lots of difficulty, but it was able to be removed. And you can see that there's a perforation, a gut extension and a cover step was placed. When the burrs are trapped, it may be very problematic. This is a Japanese case report where they use an STL1 because the rotor blader length is 135 and this is 120 centimeters. And you can actually cut the guiding cath, uh, the rotor blader, put the STL1 in, mother and child catheter, five and a seven, and therefore try to remove it. But I think in this case, when a burr is transected, it may be possible to put a second wire in because there's an 014 to tip and try to pull that out. That was successful with a snare. I'll move on. So stuck burr, maybe you should keep calm, but think, don't forget vasodilators, sedation, keeping maintaining ACTs. There's a skipping rope technique we might not talk about too much, but cutting the guide and using guide extensions are very useful. Burr transections are very rare. I've only had one personal case. I'll show you the case. This is a left main circumflex rotational arthrectomy. There's a terrible angle around the circumflex. This is what it looks like when you crossed it. It took a few, many runs to cross the osteal circumflex. And rapidly, this is what happened. That's what the angiogram looks like. And this is me and then nothing happened, let me do it again. I think what's happened is that the burr has transected. And luckily, because there's 014 and the burr was free, I was able to retrieve this without using any snares and it came out very easily. One of my colleagues actually did this case where uh, he, he uh, tried to rotate around three on osteo right coronary artery and it coquetsed forwards and it could not remove it and fractured. I think he spun um, the dinoglide and it didn't help because coming, coming back, it does not cut. It's different to orbital arthrectomy. And so this is the coquette phenomenon, Russian dolls. You squeeze, you, without cutting too much of the plaque, you push too hard and you prolapse the burr and you cannot pull it out. 
because you haven't modified the plaque. The bird was free to travel. There's a snare on the left-hand side, and the snare was able to pull back, but could not pull it out from the lesion osteally and actually snapped the bird, uh, the snare. Mm -hmm. Subsequent to this, they stented the lesion, however, left the bird. The bird traveled distally. They were very concerned about this, so they actually put a coil in, and they call it, uh, you can see at the distal end, trying to make sure no flow goes forward and not try to push it forward anymore. They worry about perforating. Rotor perforation is a very feared phenomenon. Actually, you pacing wide, if you're using pacing, can also perf the RV. Rotational related perforations may be related to um, new stents. This is a rotational arthrectomy of the right coronary artery and stenting, and they could not dilate a portion of the proximal stent despite OPN balloon to 38 atmospheres. And so they left. Six weeks later, they thought they have another go at this. This is the site. And within minutes, they tried ballooning it, did not work. And within minutes, they've caused a perforation. Patient had to go to surgery. So we really advise everyone to stay away from fresh stents. In the old days, we did stent ablation for instant restenosis and thought it was a good way of teaching fellows to do that, to do rotation with arthrectomy. Off. It's an off-label use if you want to actually cut the stents. It's a high chance of burn entrapment, high risk of perforation. And of course, we need to size up if you really want to do that. You cut the stent, cut the stent again with a bigger burr. It's probably safer with the tripsy, laser, and perhaps all the arthrectomy or also off label. This is a case from Rustum, actually. Uh, you can see that our left LAD was stented, right coronary stented, and he left the mid LAD lesion. The patient was very symptomatic. And he tried to come back and do a rotational arthrectomy, but it got stuck. And he just pulled very hard and had to cut the rotor and use a guide extension. There's a guide extension going in now and pulling it on block. And he had actually retrieved the stent completely uh, from the lesion. So when the burr does not pass through the lesion, we can sometimes downsize the burr, increase the rotor speed, max it out as it were. This is not recommended by the company. Change wire to extra support if you can. Stop a partial rotor, maybe you can dilate it now that you've modified enough. Perhaps you're going the wrong direction, but imaging is extremely helpful to determine this. And from a Japanese paper, you can see that maybe why you would perforate, maybe because there's two types. Perforation due to jumping of the, through the carina and towards a less, less calcified site like the carina or around the calcium, the deeper cut. This is a courtesy of one of my other friends in Western Australia. And you can see that after rotation around three in a 90 year old lady that actually looked like the wire initially took a, a different course through the plaque. And you can see double channel proximal LAD. And with a balloon dilatation, you can see a massive perforation. A cover stent thankfully was, uh, was done, including a drain. The patient was very stable thereafter, it did very well. But that was a very scary complication. So sometimes you can downsize the burr from 1.5 to 1.25. And even if that does not progress, Perhaps changing the wire may be useful. And so in summary, rotational, rotational arthrectomy remains the essential device for crossing calcified lesions. It assists in getting your gear down, optimizing PCI. Familiarity with the system is useful. Meticulous technique and knowing how to troubleshoot is essential. Imaging, I think, is mandatory, and we should avoid stent ablation. And a good experience, experience operators are desirable. Thank you very much. Sorry to take up too much time. Thanks, Sydney, for the wonderful talk. You know, I think for all of us who do rotablation, um, the attention to technique uh, has to be really intense and um, everyone should uh, understand how to deal with uh, some of these uh, complications. Maybe we'll just highlight one of the more common uh, kind of uh, complications and maybe get some uh, opinions from the panel on how they prevent and, and they deal with it. Um, maybe I will ask uh, Dr. Diane, um, you know, how, how would you prevent uh, slow flow or no reflow and in the event, unfortunate event that it happens, you know, what's your bailout um, strategies for no flow or slow flow? At the end? I think you're muted. Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Jonathan. Um, it's very nice lecture, Dr. Sidney, although I really enjoy it so much. Maybe in my case, to prevent this slow flow, I think, um, just to 
just to put an uh, we have to like do brief before uh do a put a nitroglycerin just to uh make sure that whether it's just a true flow the so far or not and then um what i think it's just the handling of the rotation is very um important and we have to like a uh, very uh good put a gentle um like um uh, do a when we have, want to insert the rotor bird do it very gentle and then um just to make sure uh there's no um uh, Hesitancy or uh, like uh, uh, what the 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 rota is uh, not uh, the cast the the rota is not uh, have a, a, a stuck there because um, if we we push the rota is uh, too 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 uh, uh, hard we 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 pray that we will cause a complication and um, the most important thing is that we have to know exactly where our uh, wire is because um, um, just to know whether the wire bias is very important. I think um, brief, brief, as uh, Dr. Lo mentioned, we have to know uh, exactly where the wire bias. It's very important just to know whether to prevent the slow flow after we do rotation. I think it's like that, Jonathan. Yeah, so I think um, once again, you know, very meticulous attention to technique, you know, where we don't use too much force, we really gently ablate, you know, we help to reduce the um, incidence of slow flow and no flow. And, you know, in the event that such a case happens, you know, we need to understand, you know, why this happens, you know, is it just a distal embolization or is it dissection or is it um, anything wrong with the anatomy? So, you know, a distal injection, you know, sometimes will help to answer some of these questions in addition to uh, injecting some of these uh, cocktails of medicines. Uh, Thana, what do you have a comment? Uh, yes, uh, I want to ask Dr. Sidney Lowe about the uh, uh, four high-risk rotabator in the high-risk patients. Uh, what is your consideration about to put some device, uh, for example, for hemodynamic support, IBP, uh, or Impella, ECMO, to high-risk patients to uh, prevent the complication? Which type of care to put the device before the do the case? I, I, I'll, I'll comment on that, and I want to just complete the no reflow a little bit. I think um, the IBIS predictors of no reflow are kind of large caliber vessel, high lipid burden, naivety of statins, positive remodeled vessel due to the plaque, as well as, uh, um, you know, not being on to, uh, good antiplatelets. But I think that in rotation rhythmectomy, if you're exposing that lipid plaque with rotation rhythmectomy cross, crossing over the plaque. Mm -hmm. But secondly, I think under recognize there's limited perforation. I show you that adventitial hematoma, but I've also experienced cases whereby I had no reflow and I very rarely experienced no reflow. And I realized that I missed this, but I did image it. Sometime later, looking at the IVUS, there was a limited perforation. So probably now that we're imaging more, you may see this on occasion. If that happens to you, think there's maybe a perforation there. You haven't got a mushroom angiographic um, picture, but you don't want to overexpand that too much because I think you probably have caused a little mini perforation there. So I think next time you do that, either OCT or IVUS, have a look. There may be perforation or alternatively, you see lots of fatty plaque. But for MCS, look, we, we usually use MCS is expensive, mechanical cardiac support. Uh, but we do impeller, the, we have impeller, the people with, um, we have to do a rotational atherectomy in the left main that has poor LV function. But these days now we do particularly put in, uh, do a right heart cap before. We assess the LDB, RA pressures, PA pressures, PA sats, and get a good idea what's happening before we put it in. But chances are, if you're doing a, a delicate patient with a left main rotor, then I would probably, and high risk anatomy, I would put an uh, impeller in in my hospital. Uh, but it's not routine because of cost. Most in the old days, we did balloon pumps for that. And very rarely ECMO. We did have ECMO. And sometimes we had we did cases on ECMO. You know, I think a concept that's also very hard to appreciate for some of the beginners uh, in doing rotablations. How do you utilize and what are the tips and tricks of utilizing this rotor bias uh, to help in uh, ablating calcium? Maybe I'll pose this question uh, to Dr. Jack. You know, do you have any tips and tricks uh, for the audience you know, on how you can um, help to use this uh, rotor wire as well as the rotor bias to ablate calcium? So uh, again, it comes back to the imaging and understanding that uh, most of the plug is 
actually opposite side to the carina. So of, most times the plug is quite obvious, even <laughs> angiographically. And, uh, but really when you put in the IVAS imaging catheter, then you can see the true uh, bias. Um, very rarely you have to manipulate either the guide position or although Sydney said he never used uh, rotor extra support, sometimes I use the rotor extra support just to achieve the extra wire bias. Occasionally, the uh, you will have to wire into a side branch or the main branch to get that wire pointing towards the uh, appropriate bias. The other approach that um, for safety wise is a halfway rotablation approach that I think Sydney didn't mention as well. Most times the uncrackable, unpassable lesion is in the front lead in. So if it's very tortuous, you don't actually have to try too hard to rotate through the lesion. You can create a knob uh, in the front part and then uh, do the leopard crawl maneuver and complement it. Nowadays, we rotate uh, tripsy approach. Right? I think those are some of the safety uh, parts. The part about no flow is, I think no one mentioned it, but patience. I think we all are not so patient. Uh, a lot of us are trying to get through everything in one pass, but sometimes there's so much calcium there, you really have to break it apart and do shorter burr runs, particularly when the EF is poor. Uh, the other approach that Sydney uh, mentioned about using a uh, right heart care is that sometimes you can do a maybe MCS approach. You put in the right heart care halfway through, you can see the PA pressure creeping up, you know, the sets dropping a bit, the mix sets coming down, that's when I think the MCS can go in before it continues. So some of the halfway, MCS halfway uh, rotor approach. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, so, so I think those are really very useful tips and tricks uh, that have been covered by the panel. I think one important point is to always look at the hemodynamics. You know, if your blood pressure is dropping, you know, you, you may want to um, take a step back, you know, instead of uh, persisting um, uh, too aggressively. And uh, one other important pointer, you know, that Dr. Sidney mentioned about cutting the um, rotor blader and putting in a guide extension. You know, for those of you who have not done it before, I think on a simple rotor case, after the end of the case, you know, do take a scissors, you know, and, and try it yourself, you know, in a more calm and um, elective setting so that you, when you actually need to do it, you know, you, you will know what to do. So with that, uh, let's move on to our uh, next case. Uh, we have a very interesting case uh, that's coming up and we have uh, Dr. Tanvi Ahmad from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, is going to talk to us. Uh, Hello. Andrew, Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Can you share your slides? Just, yeah, I'm just showing. Is it visible? No, we can't see your slides yet. Uh, yeah. Is it visible now? Yeah, we can see it. Uh, now. Uh, okay. Uh, so, first, I'd like to thank APSC uh, to give me the chance to this. And uh, sorry, sorry, I think something went wrong. Okay, am I audible now? Sorry, there was some connection yes, we, problem. So, yeah, okay, we can see and hear you. Okay, so it's about the uh, rotative tripsy case. So it's about a 74 year old gentleman who's hypertensive diabetic presented with class three, four angina. He was on optimal medical management for the last two months. Uh, he had a history of non STMI and he was uh, put on a permanent pacemaker due to intermittent complete health block to get the population. It was normal. So the NG was actually done uh, two months back in another hospital, which we can see there is a uh, calcified uh, lesion in LED. The left main is normal and uh, L6 seems to be quite okay. RC was anomalous, and we can see there was some uh, uh, calcified tissue in the proximal segment as well. The syntax, as you can see, is 15, so both the options were available, but considering the heavy calcification, the patient was advised for CMEG, but uh, he opted for a medical therapy, and two months uh, later, he came back uh, for revascularization, uh, still adamant not for going to CBD. So the challenges, if you go for PTCA, one, the age was 72, 
uh, amputation was CKD stage 3A having creatinine of around 1.3, 1.4, calcified double vessel, and anomalous RCA. So what was our plan here? Our plan uh, was first definitely we have to do this dye. Though we are a radial center, we opted for the femoral route to get the excess support and also to tackle the anomalous origin of the RCA and to go for imaging help to learn about the morphology and to select the devices. So first we decided to tackle the RCA uh, where we took a seven branch AL guiding catheter and then we took a BMW wire to cross the ocean. Uh, we tried to cross the IVUS first, but as there was some difficulty in crossing the IVUS, so we uh, thought we will balloon the lesion up from it because the lesion didn't seem this, uh, that much significantly loaded with calcium angiographically. So uh, bed depression was done using 2.53 balloon and looked like it expanded quite well. So after we did the pre-dilatation, uh, we again uh, tried to uh, uh, image the vessel. But again, we face the same problem. Uh, so what now? Uh, try harder with divers or go the conventional way, this old school of thoughts, the angiographic view with the ballooning and stenting the lesion. The divers, the 60 hertz are actually quite fragile and get the experience of them breaking down or getting stuck in the vessel. So we went opted against pushing the divers. So we were satisfied with the initial pre-dilatation. So we went for a body wear support, we took a stand and then uh, inflated it. Angiographically, the post-dilatation using three 3.5 balloon uh, looked quite good. And as you can see, use the shorter balloon. And we used 412 balloon because uh, the initial pictures where we took the IVAS, it got stuck in the midpoint. We could see the vessel diameter was near to four. So we used 412 balloon to optimize the proximal part of RCA. So this was the angiographic view in RCA. We are happy with the RCA. Then we moved uh, to the LED where we had all the issues actually. So uh, uh, LED, as we can see, angiographically, there was severe calcification, no doubt about that. So uh, uh, again, we tried for the IVAS. But it didn't go through. But what we could see is there was uh, subpotential calcium in the proximal segment as well. So we can appreciate the amount of calcium that would be present in the uh, later segments where the IVUS was not crossing. So what now? Whether we go for rota or an IVL or rotational electrophone. We don't have the rotational electrophone yet in our country. We do have the rota, and uh, IVL is just a year old in Bangladesh. So we went for upfront rotablation in this case. We used a 1.5 bar lesion, and we can see the lesion was nicely cracked, and uh, we can see the nice polishing touch uh, soon after. So uh, once the rota was done, we decided to uh, dilate the lesion using a 2.7520. So the first part was fine, but then started the trouble. So uh, what went wrong? The balloon actually burst, and then there was a dissection or a perforation, not much sure. So we just immediately switched the balloon. Uh, we took another balloon. We just dilated it and stopped the blood flow. We did an echo, so there was no effusion. So most probably that could be a last dissection with the dye hanging up on the vessel wall with a ruptured balloon. So, uh, and the next thing we tried to prepare the bed in the proximal part, but uh, then started the second problem. The proximal part was having some hard lesions and some dog bone effects and was not dilating uh, well. So, now the patient was hemodynamically stable, no effusion in ego. So, we took a small short check shot just to see what the vessel looked like. We dilated the uh, lesion in the distal part, we prepared the bed, keeping a cover stand in case things go wrong. We didn't do the IVAS at this moment actually because of the hard uh, point in the proximal part bearing the IVAS might not go through it uh, properly. So what now for the proximal part? There were some hard lesions in the proximal part. Should we use a cutting balloon, OPN? Should we go for a rota with a larger bar? Um, there is always increased chance of increasing the resection flap, or should we go for an IVL? As it was a small point where we were actually 
filling the problem. So we thought it would be better to go for an IVL in this case. So we went for an IVL. We took a 312 IVL balloon and placed it at the point of interest and we started the intrusion. The first 10 pulses were successful. But then came the next trouble. You can see in the next pulses, the IVL actually burst. So this was our first uh, case of burst IVL in the country. And uh, fortunately, I saw a similar case of the Putinangshu presenting an IVL uh, burst balloon. So uh, we had a burst IVL, we had a burst balloon, and a rota was done. So what next? The good thing was the IVL had actually given in 15 pulses. The burst balloon, they have the granuloplast effect. The conventional uh, way of dealing when uh, we didn't have the rota five years back, seven years back. So there was some uh, granuloplast effect and the initial pulses, we thought it could have uh, modified the lesions somewhat. So what we did first is uh, we stented the distal part where we thought the pre dilatation was good enough. Uh, because we dilated, uh, we prepared the bed with 2.75 uh, balloon. And so we stented the, that part of the vessel, so not to extend the dissection flap distally. And then we did an IVAS. This time the IVAS actually went smoothly without much difficulty. So what the IVAS actually looked like, the vessel distally was nicely opposed with the stent. MLA was satisfactory. In the proximal part, we can see uh, there are some reverberation shadows, there are some cracks. So the rota had actually done its job. And we were looking whether there was any significant nodule or not, but we could not appreciate the presence of any significant nodule. It, one reason could be that uh, the IBL uh, could have modified the lesion uh, and uh, it could have cracked the uh, uh, calcium. So uh, it's not vis visualized in the next IBUS. So what now? Bed preparation should be optimized in the proximal part before we go for an instant implantation, and that is a must. And we need to keep in mind the cost because using two IVL, two rota is definitely going to cost a lot. Risk of perforation, definitely. We need to have a backup support of the power stand and calcium, or the, uh, the most important factor here. So uh, going back to this uh, old school of thought, we started with the NC balloon. We did stage dilatation using 2.5238 balloons. We saw in different views if the orthogonal uh, 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 views and seems like the lesions have been uh, dilated somewhat uh, well. So before we uh, went into stenting, we just dilated the uh, diagonal we seem to be a big vessel with a 215 NC balloon, and then we put a uh, 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 stent in the proximal part of the LED. Stent was deployed successfully, and angiographically did not show much of any indentations. Uh, post dilatation was done using 315 and then 3.5 balloon in the proximal parts. So we did an IVAS again to see the stent position and optimization. So uh, as we can see, there was uh, some indentation in the overlap area where the stent of position was not quite uh, satisfactory or uh, satisfactory to our light. So in this case, we did a, a post dilatation again at the point where, uh, at the point of MLA using a 3.5, uh, balloon. So we repeated an IVAS again after that. You can see the MLA was more than 90% of the distal uh, reference vessel. So final angiographic shot uh, was satisfactory for us. So uh, some take home messages, which uh, uh, I think was important in my lesions. While dealing with uh, calcified lesion, we, might, we must have different tools uh, to bail out in a crisis situation. Imaging does help. And we should never understand, estimate the importance of imaging pre and post uh, lesion modification. We should always target optimal results, no doubt, but sometimes enemy of uh, good is best. And in some situ situations, we should satisfy with good results, especially in complex and bailout lesions. And finally, as John said, it's difficult to get good mentors. I have a good mentor. And as John always says, once you get a good mentor, you should never leave him. So my, I would like to thank my mentor who always says he's always patient first and he's always sitting over me. And finally, I would like to invite you all to Bangladesh Live in May 1st and 2nd. Thank you all.
Thanks, uh, Tanvir. It was really very insightful cases. You know, I think we all learn a lot from seeing um, different cases uh, from uh, different operators. Maybe I'd like to uh, ask um, Vishnu for some comments. Uh, why, why do you think so many balloons burst even after the um, first 1.5 mm uh, rotation? Is there anything that you potentially would have done differently? So, it, so it's quite interesting that we always talking about the same thing. Uh, in burst in burst situation, it's always nodular and it's always sharp. So I'd like to share some experience because probably unlike unlike uh, any others, I have more experience with uh, orbital atrachomy than rota. So orbital atrachomy has been in Indonesia for about a little bit more than two years, and I had the privilege to do probably around five to ten cases. And in my opinion, it's quite good to uh, to tackle the the nodular calcification. So it it will not work really well when you when you have a situation with a thick calcium because it will only uh, ablate the surface, starting from the surface. But in case of nodular calcification, it will at least unsharpen the nodular the nodular. So. You have very less uh, burst balloon case after you do orbital astrectomy. But the weakness of the orbital is because they need a little space to start to rotate. So probably will be ideal for a vessel for more than 2.0. But uh, in your you made a very excellent case stand fair. You, you had an IVL, you had a rota, and it all still lead to burst uh, condition. It might also because of the wire bias, nobody knows in that case whether it, it really has a good contact or not. But in your in your case, I think uh, orbital atrectomy might help with the nodular calcification. Right, but still not available in Bangladesh, maybe in the near future. We are hoping <laughs> to get it within a month or two. Well, uh, contrary to you, I have access to orbital, but not IVL. <laughs> Maybe I can ask uh, Vincent to chip in here. You know, what's your opinion on um, uh, orbital attractomy and versus rotation for some of these nodular uh, calcium? Um, you can share your personal experience. Yeah, I do agree in that circumstances. Uh, orbital attractomy probably work better you know, because, you know, um, rotablator, it's, uh, sometimes it, it's determined by the y bias. You know, and many of time is not where you can control. Of course, you, you can play around with the why, with the guiding direction, but it's not always then you can, you know, get what you have. Uh, on the other hand, orbital aphrectomy, in fact, it, it helps a little bit. And I do agree that um, I have less uh, balloon rupture after orbital aphrectomy. So to me, um, in case of uh, eccentric, as a vacation, then I tend to use uh, orbital rather than rotablation. But of course, if you have a circumferential or really tight, you know, small uh, lumen, then rotablator probably the first to go with. And of course, in larger ves vessels, then IVL will be the option. So I do fully agree that, you know, all three tools, including like cutting balloons, OPN, you know, all these are. Uh, you know, run hand in hand, you know, it helps in different scenarios. And I think back to the the key um, answer, I think um, imaging will help us to choose um, the weapon from our shelf. And at the end, you know, the patient has the best outcome. But as uh, many of times, I do feel that, you know, these procedure is getting more and more expensive. You know, sometimes when you have a road ablation, then probably you want to go for um, uh, orbital and then probably at the end you want, you know, your IVL in, in your left main or distal uh, osseo LED. So uh, in private setting, you know, cause it is an issue. Uh, and now we need to get the odds of how to get the best out, out of the, the pockets, you know, other than otherwise it can be, you know, like a, a, a TAVI procedure if you do a, a PCI with, you know, calcification. Yeah. So, so I think all of us agree that calcium is really the enemy and imaging helps. And, you know, we have so many tools available now to tackle this and we really need to choose it properly. Maybe you'll take a quick comment from uh, Dr. Sydney. 
I was just going to ask about this, uh, uh, like osteocircumflex nodule. Uh, do you prefer Vincent to to run um, cutting backwards because it cuts backwards with uh, try to sort of you know, sort of uh, get it to assist down and actually come back to cut because obviously that's more efficient and it cuts the right side. Yeah, I think if you you know for for orbital, you know, of course you can go forward and backward, but to me for that. Those cases, like bifurcation or even in the osteolabning, I tend to go back. You know, I feel that you know that would be more safe, and of course, many of the time uh, with that, you know, it helps in, in the um, when they uh, wire bias to cut the inner curve on that the part. So um, many of the time, I go backward. But again, it depends on the case where the the, the wire bias will go. Um, again, at the end, it's safety come first. Yeah, I agree with Vincent. And also personally, um, for myself, uh, for osteo lesions like osteo RCA, osteo left main, uh, my preference would be orbital, uh, because I, I could go backward with my um ablation. And also when the calcium is in at the inner curve, then of course orbital when you pull it backwards, then you can't ablate whatever calcium you want on the inner curve. Um so I think this is an excellent discussion. Um uh, on orbital, um, uh, leading to the last talk of the night by Dr. Sue from the Prince Charles Hospital, Australia, who will uh, go through a case of orbital etherectomy with us. Dr. Sue. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Sue. Can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, APSC, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present the case. Um, I have a case of 80-year-old uh, independent men who presented with complete heart block um, in January 2022, and pacemaker was inserted that time. He also had an um, acute kidney injury, um, baseline creatinine about 110, and that time 226, um, and uh, which was resolved um, uh, likely um, from the hypoperfusion, which was resolved a few weeks later. He had a pacemaker check six weeks later, showed 11 episodes of non-sustained VT and longest was 20 seconds. And he also developed angina class two and NYT class two dyspnea at that time. He had a background history of atrial fibrillation on anticoagulation, type two diabetes, which is well controlled, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, peripheral vascular disease with previous femoral popliteal bypass in 2019 and CKD stage 3A and skin cancer. Um, he had echo that time when he had a uh, pacemaker, uh, normal LVEF, uh, normal right, um, function, right ventricular function, my AS and um, one by four MR and no regional wall motion abnormalities. We repeated echo in March, his EF uh, stay around like 58% and other parameters and change. So we decided to do the coronary angiogram, um, which showed um, on the right um, coronary artery, you can see the uh, focal tight um, lesions, calcified lesions in the proximal RCA. And when you go to the left, there is a severe calcified lesions um, in the uh, mid-second flex. And when you look at the um, cranial view, um, there is a um, quite um, severe lesions, calcified lesions in the mid um, LED. And uh, which is quite tight here. So he's got a uh, severe uh, three calcified three bursa disease. Um, so we refer to the cardiothoracic surgeon because of the symptoms um, and um, because of the age and um, other comorbidities. Um, he is not for um, coronary uh, artery bypass surgery. 
So uh, we plan to do the stage PCI. Um, he's got a very tortured subclavian artery and a radial artery spasm. So we use the six French uh, rain wheel sheetless uh, um, access system. Uh, so what is it is the outer diameter of the uh, six French guide uh, with the rain wheel uh, sheetless access system is um, you can see here two French uh, smaller in comparison to the traditional um, uh, six French glide sheet and uh, 1.5 French um, smaller in comparison with the um, glide sheet slender. So uh, you uh, put it together, um, a six French um, guide catheter uh, loaded with the um, uh, railway dilator and uh, put it together up to the brachiocephalic artery. When it reaches the brachiocephalic artery, you can remove the dilator and engage the guide catheter as usual. So we did the, we started with the IVAS to the Proxima RCA, and you can see there is a second fractional um, calcium in the uh, uh, Proxima RCA. The ostium was good. So uh, we decided to do the orbital arthrectomy. Um, so this is the um, orbital arthrectomy system at a glance. Um, there is an infusion pump. Uh, there is a uh, pump which um, uh, allows the uh, fibrous light uh, uh, solution um, to run through, uh, which lubricates the uh, uh, system um, through the uh, spin. And then uh, you have you can see the uh, handle with the um, uh, crown attached uh, to the. Uh, uh, handle and um, there is a break and uh, you can choose two speeds. Uh, low speed is 80,000 uh, RPM and a high speed is 120,000 RPM. There is also a glide assist mode uh, which give uh, 5,000 RPM. So um, the one thing um, you need to be aware of is the uh, viper slide is contraindicated in patients with egg yolk and a swiping allergies. And you take the 20 mil, um, it came in with the uh, 100 mil bag and you take 20 mil out of the the, um, uh, handle me back and then mix with a one liter of saline and attach to the um, uh, pump. So maximum recommended treatment interval uh, should be less than 30 seconds and um, the, the pump will emit a beep uh, after 20 seconds of treatment time then you should uh, stop this time and, uh, and rest for the uh, 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 setting period which should be same length as your treatment time or even greater than the treatment time um, to um, give the uh, time to clear the uh, debris. So maximum treatment time per uh, orbital arthrectomy device is five minutes. So uh, we use the uh, Viber wire advanced with a flex tip, uh, uh, so which is floppy and shapeable tip, uh, which allows the increased uh, flexibility, kink resistance, and the reduce uh, wire bias. Um, this is the orbital uh, diamond coated um, uh, classic crown and just eccentrically uh, mounted. Um, you can use with a six French uh, or greater than um, six French uh, guide catheter uh, for the uh, orbital arthrectomy. Uh, the crown is 1.25 millimeter crown, uh, which uh, can treat 2.5 to 4 millimeter vessels, which is a bi-directional sending. Um, so one important thing is um, the um, distal part of the nose should be um, away from the uh, spring tip, uh, proximal part of the spring tip. It should be uh, at least five millimeter, uh, preferably more than 10 millimeter uh, to prevent the um, dislodging of the spring tip uh, when it interacts. So there are two mechanism of uh, actions of the orbital arthrectomy. One is the um, differential sending, uh, which is the uh, diamond coated uh, crown uh, that rotates in an expanding uh, lateral direction uh, with increasing centrifugal forces, uh, which um, uh, results in a, um, uh, in a differential sending of the um, calcium uh, ca uh, coronary calcification. And applying the um, uh, centrifugal forces, uh, that um, diamond um, crown, um, when it uh, orbits um, as the, you know, it goes into the artery, which allows the uh, uh, blood flow um, to the uh, complete blood flow to the um, coronary artery. So with this unit mechanism of uh, action, uh, with this like an average particulate size about a two micromole, um, which um, uh, which um, allows the um, you know less uh, uh, no reflow or the uh, transient complete heart block uh, with the um, orbital arthrectomy. 
The other um, mechanism of action um, is the positive forces, uh, which creates the um, uh, microfractures to modify the deep calcium. So um, these um, two mechanisms of action, uh, bidirectional uh, differential sending and the uh, fracturing, um, which uh, subsequently um, you know, modify the change, the plaque morphology, versa compliance, and uh, which allows the um, uh, adequate uh, stent expansion. So um, uh, Viper wire um, can um, wire can be wired um, directly. Uh, we started with the um, uh, uh, walk hose wire because we wanted to do the an uh, IVIS. Um, so uh, Viper wire uh, wired, and then like we started the uh, orbital arthrectomy to the uh, Proxima RCA. Um, so always start with the uh, low speed um, to, for the initialization. And then uh, because the vessel is um, three, more than uh, three uh, millimeter, uh, we increase to the 120 um, RPM. Uh, we did the eight passes. And then after that, we change back to the uh, walk hose wire before proceeding to the stent. And then uh, predilate with the uh, two by 12 NC balloon and then increase to 2.5 by 12. And we did IVAS again before the um, uh, stent. Um, and then we need to modify a bit more. So uh, we use the uh, NC 3.5 uh, before stent. And then we use the 3.5 by 15 drag eluting stent and the post dilate with the 3.5 by 12 uh, high pressure um, in the Proxima RCA. So this is the post PCI to the Proxima RCA. And uh, we did the IVIS post, uh, which showed uh, the stand is um, well opposed, uh, expanded well, and um, no dissection. Um, so we move on to the mid-second flex. Uh, we attempted to do the IVIS uh, mid-second flex, um, but because of the angle and uh, we, the IVIS could not um, cross the lesion, um, and but we did uh, IVIS to the proximal part. Um, there is there are like some calciums in the, uh, um, in sorry, uh, we managed to do the uh, IVUS to the uh, mid-second flex. Um, there is here uh, some calcium, no juice uh, there. Um, so uh, we wire with the Viper wire. And at this time um, uh, we use the uh, um, orbital arthrectomy uh, high speed, started with the low speed as usual. And then I'll increase to 120 um, uh, high speed and then like five presses. And then uh, predilate with the uh, three by twelve NC, and then again we could not um, deliver the stent, um, so we use the um, guideliner five French and uh, predilate more with the semi compliant balloon three by twelve, and then after that, um, and then uh, the stent three by fifteen stent was deployed and post dilate with uh, three by twelve NC the high pressure. Um, this is the post PCI to the uh, mid second flex. And then we are um, uh, moving to the um, LED. Um, again, Ivers um, could not pass the uh, Proxima LED. Um, and um, this time uh, we were unable to wire the fiber wire. Um, so we used the 10 pi LP uh, microcatheter to uh, wire the fiber wire to the distant LED. Um, with the um, uh, guideliner five French, um, we um, deliver the uh, orbital arthrectomy, and then um, this time we only use the low speed um, AT RPM uh, to the mid LED. Um, and predilate with the NC two by five by twelve and um, semi compliant three by fifteen, um, and then we deploy the um, two by seven five by eighteen drag eluting stent um, and post dilate after that. So this is the post PCI to the mid LED. Unfortunately, I couldn't find. We did the um, uh, IVUS uh, post uh, and uh, before uh, to the uh, before uh, PCI to the LED as well. But uh, all the images were um, gone. Um, couldn't find it. So this is the um, pre and post PCI of the um, RCA. And uh, this is pre and post um, of the uh, mid left second flex. 
And uh, this is the pre and post uh, pictures of the uh, mid LED. Um, so he has been pain free um, after that and um, no more admission to the um, hospital uh, with a cutting problem. So in conclusion, um, calcified coronary lesions are associated with uh, adverse short and long-term outcomes and management can be challenging. Uh, meticulous uh, lesion preparation with calcium modification tools essential to achieve the optimal results. And intravascular imaging is invaluable in not only assessing the lesion severity, which also determine the choice of calcium modification tools and uh, effectiveness of the modification and debugging method. And it optimizes the result of the PCI and also uh, minimize the contrast use. So um, last one is the railway sheetless access system can be used to, uh, which allow us to perform the transradial multiversal coronary intervention um, through a tortuous um, small size radial artery. So I'd like to thank Dr. Datov uh, for this case. Uh, we did that together a year ago. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, Dr. Sue. That was um, an excellent case. Um, very good result in a very challenging anatomy. Um, so I, I noticed you didn't really um, attempt any ballooning before you did your um, orbital, which is a very important point for orbital because um, if you attempted ballooning and then caused major dissection, that case would not be suitable for orbital atherectomy. And, um, and, and an interesting point is, uh, uh, it's not really a question for your case, as your case already has a permanent pacemaker in. But um, so for um, Rhoda, especially for the RCA, we often put a temp um, pacing wire in. But for orbital, that seems more optional. Vishnu, um, you did a lot of orbital, right? Um, do you put in a temp wire for um, RCA orbital? Not really. In fact, I, I never put the temporary pacemaker and so far, so far, so good. So, but I didn't choose uh, many of the com uh, more complex lesions for the RCA. So probably I haven't found it yet. <laughs> but the impression is the debris is not as much as Strota. That, that's that's yeah. my impression so far. Uh, I agree. Um, for Rhoda, it's, um, I've, I've tried to like um, be lazy and not do the temp wire, and then I, I regretted it. So I always do it for for Rhoda. But uh, I think for orbital, usually you can get away get away with it. Um, any other thoughts about um, this case uh, or orbital in general for calcium? Maybe uh, I can quickly okay, sure, jump sure. in here. Yeah. Yes, Jack. Sorry, Vishnu, just a quick one. Uh, I, I like the case you you demonstrated very well the effectiveness of uh, orbital in that case. Uh, just some quick thoughts. I, I agree with the previous comment, especially for the osteo lesions, uh, doing backwards on the orbital seems to be uh, definitely a safer approach. It's also nice because you can use a six French system for larger arteries without upsizing a burr, and it's a one device uh, uh, polishing uh, uh, artrectomy. Uh, one observation I have is that very seldom, even for larger vessels, I find a need to go high speed. In fact, that's when I get into trouble, particularly with high speed. When I go high speed, I tend to get no flow or the pacing requirements that you talked about. So I, I tend to want to use just the low speed multiple passes and maybe, maybe just a quick high speed run, but not, not too aggressive on that. The other thing I found in, in for example, your case, we always often have this issue of Roblation, when you go too long, the diamond gets uh, bladed off. I'm, I'm, you use the same uh, uh, OAS burr for all the three lesions in one setting, right? In that yes. case. And yes. Uh, has anyone found that the, uh, the diamond on the burr gets blunted off? So far, mm -hmm. I, I don't have this experience as well. I'm not too sure whether that's an issue. And yeah, go ahead. Sorry. 
Yeah, we had, uh, we've done uh, 23 patients uh, with the 39 lesions. Uh, we've done a few uh, three vessel or two vessels um, um, uh, orbital and the same setting. Um, we had no issues uh, with that uh, problem uh, so far. Um, and, um, but as long as you um, did the rest period, um, you rest uh, in between the uh, rents. Uh, I think um, so far it's okay. The last bit about debris, right? Um, yeah. Recently, I, I did use uh, even larger uh, OAS device for the peripheral artery, and I put in uh, one of the Abbott filters, and I got lots of debris. So I, I think in the current setting, we get away with it because arteries are actually much smaller in diameter, but for the larger ones, you're going to get debris, I think. Um, but we're getting away from that. Uh, Vishnu, yeah. uh, back to you. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. It's it, you made a very good point, especially on the oscillations. No, just want to add on. Uh, just a reminder for the higher speed in OAS. Usually, we only use it for a larger diameter because of the nature of the physics. So when you have a higher rotation, so it will expand more. So usually, even if it's quite calcified, we never use it in quite a smaller artery, less than three point oh. Usually, we only use uh, lower speeds. Do you have any experience on that, uh, Sue? Um, so, um, yes, so the larger, uh, the higher speed should not be used um, in the vessel um, less than 3.0. If, if you have to use it, uh, if you're not happy with this um, um, modification, uh, you can use it, but very um, um, short period um, in the um, less than 3.0 uh, vessel, but it should be avoided in less than 3.0 vessel. Um, and also the transfer speed, uh, well, when you do it, uh, it should be um, slow, uh, one millimeter per second, so that uh, it has a more um, contact uh, intact with this um, um, vessel and uh, you can have a more ablation rather than the high speed. And also we okay. have uh, uh, we have no um, temporary pacing use in any of the cases and um, there was no um, no reflow or um, slow reflow in any of the cases so far. Uh, Jonathan, can I ask a question? Uh... Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Uh, to, yes, sir. To, 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 Please go ahead. Uh, to, to many people who've used a lot of orbital, uh, unlike us, uh, do you think there is a difference of uh, differential cutting between the orbital and the rotablator device? Because in the rotablator device, the differential cutting is directly proportion, inversely proportional to speed. So the higher is the speed, more is the differential cutting. Lower is the speed, less is the differential cutting. So it cuts normal tissue if it is at very slow speed because it wobbles, the burr of wobbles. Whereas in the orbital, the more dissections happen on the larger speed, whereas less dissections happen on a lower speed. So do you think there is a difference in device, uh, you know, how they uh, have differential cutting effect between the two? Uh, that's a very difficult question, uh, but excellent question. I, I don't really know, but my, my, my thought is, um, in theory, they, they do uh, preferential cutting, but in reality, it looks like both devices would cut normal and calcified tissue, like, to be honest, like, even with orbital, I've seen they create a big hole on the normal side in an eccentric lesion. And, and so like, uh, especially at high speed, as you said, um, so uh, I'm not exactly sure, like, really, um, uh, preferential uh, cutting is, uh, is actually like, in real life, it's it's true or not because oh. it looks more to me as in theory because in practice I see a lot of normal tissue being cut out yeah. um, with either device. Yeah, so I ask this because when uh, I, I was training at one uh, in uh, US uh, years ago, the, the, they were enrolling patients for the orbital trial, the orbit trial. So I was part of the trial and we used to see a lot more dissections with orbital in the normal tissue as compared to rotablator. So we always thought that probably differential cutting is less with orbital, and that is why they went from higher speed to lower speed. Whereas the differential cutting is much more effective in the rotablator, and that is why we avoid orbital in tortuous vessels because it cuts a lot of normal tissue, and you have post balloon perforations on the healthier segment because it weakens the wall so much towards that side. And that is why I, I feel that you know orbital I have a lot to learn because most of the nodular lesions are at the bend points. Generally, they are in the mid RCA. Or in the they are in the ostium mid LED. So 
So, you know, they are perfect recipe for a perforation with the orbital. So that is why, you know, uh, we were very reluctant. I, I am personally very reluctant to up, uh, use orbitals. So I just wanted some experience from the people who've used it a lot more. Thanks. Um, Sydney? Um, it's inter interesting because uh, when I was learning rotational arthrectomy, we talked about all these things about high speed, low speed. And Mark Reisman came up with his in vitro study. And then we changed a little bit of the practice where smaller burrs we platform outside the patient at 180, 190,000 RPMs, expecting 10,000 less in the body. And the larger burrs that we were platforming at 160, expecting only 150,000 in the patient. And of course, more recently, Rota Monster uh, basically said you should run high speed and then uh, if you want to cut more, run low speed. I never do that because I think most likely there's an increased risk of burr stalling. So I don't generally teach that to the fellows. And the wobble, you know, we talked a lot about the wobble because uh, in my day, um, many years ago, in the 90s, we talked about um, 1.25 and 1 1.5 millimeter burrs cutting more than the channel. But we do lots of imaging and almost never does that. So um, the rotor, uh, the wobble is an in vitro model. It does wobble at lower speeds, but that's centrifugal forces. And I think that in a, in a patient, the Y bias and the tension drives your burr. And so it's much less in contact with normal oh, vessel yes. because it's not touching the wall. So overall, your orbital is the whole thing. So I suspect it touches every, everything in that yeah. lumen. So more likely it will touch the normal vessel. So um, And the speed, et cetera, may contribute even more to it. Uh, but I just, now, now, now that I'm doing rotor now, I just platform um, really very high, 190 or more for the small burst. And 2.0, maybe 170, uh, 180, but I don't use the low speeds. Yeah. And now one last comment from uh, Deanne. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Um, what, what I want to say is that um, not only for the strategy for um, choosing whether it's rotational atrotomy or OAS, I think the most important thing is to choose the balloon after we put the rotational atherectomy. I think uh, one in, in my experience, I think to put um, a combination of rotational arthritis and cutting balloon is better than to put scoring or even the NC balloon. I think whether the choose of the rotation and the, um, the, the, the device itself, the, the follow-up balloon for the strategy of um, calcification, I think it will solve the most of the problem, whether nodular, or circum circumferential, and so on. I think, uh, how, may, how is it in your opinion or experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Diana. I think in the interest of time, we may uh, close. Um, I'd like to quickly summarize some of our main learning points from this session. You know, I've learned a lot and I'm sure my panelists as well as uh, my co-chair and all of you would agree. So I think uh, some of the main take-home points is uh, number one, you know, imaging, as we have seen from uh, Dr. Gupta's talk, is crucial. It could be IVERS, it could be OCT. You know, my advice is to choose what you're familiar with. If you don't know what you're looking at, you know, then there's no point doing it. So choose something that you're familiar with so that you understand what you're looking at. That's number one. And number two, from Dr. Sydney's talk, you know, we understand you know, there's um, a lot of things uh, to take note of uh, when doing rotabulation. People can choose the floppy, the stiff wire, whatever speed. You know, just do what you're comfortable with. And with each case you learn, be prepared for complications. You know, I would suggest uh, really preparing everything beforehand. You know, before each case, you have everything on standby and you practice, you know, uh, bailing yourself out uh, on in the more comfortable uh, bench top models and then you know when something bad happens uh, as we heard from Tanvir you know always call for help you know don't try to manage it alone you know it's it's much better to have someone um, by your side helping you and so uh, with that um, I would like to call this session to a close I'd like to thank uh, everyone for staying back so late on a Saturday night and I'd like to thank my co-chair as well as our fellow speakers and panelists for uh, joining us today and I look forward to our next session. Uh, we're going to, just a quick uh, tidbit for everybody, you know, we're going to talk about CTOs the next round. So do stay tuned for our fourth edition. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great session. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.